got a faculty position at UC Berkeley uh, two years ago, and you know now I raised about six million in the first two years of my faculty job. And uh, so my dream, <laughs> I have many dreams, but my main dream was to to build a new life form. But when I encountered, you know, death and sickness in my family, I thought, could we build a biology where we don't have to die, where we can upgrade parts of our body on the fly and live ha ha happier and healthier? And of course, <laughs> it's very hard to f to find this idea, especially if you're undergraduate student or graduate student. So I did my undergrad in chemistry. My PhD is in chemistry too. Um, I grew up in Russia, and of course, funding is not that great. Political situation not that great, so I'm here, just across the, the bridge from San Francisco, and I, I have a lab now about 20 people, and um, so <laughs> the the goal of our lab is to to fit this entire Intel factory into uh, a test tube. It's not even molecular printer, so actually, maybe printer is not required. You can just build in information into components. And if you look at how nanoscale devices are built these days uh, through top-down approach, which is probably the most sophisticated technology that humanity ever developed. And it's part of many, many devices that we use every day, like computer chips, microfluidics, optical interconnects, but it's somewhat inflexible approach. And if you know the cost of the most recent ASML tool that allows you to do extreme UV lithography is about $500 million. And that's, <laughs> you know, many companies like Intel, Samsung already bought five of them, even though only one was built so far. And if you look at this uh, Intel factory and the devices that manufactured there, um, you can see if you zoom in that they're not super precise, but if you zoom in onto a pond scum in a, near the parking lot of this Intel factory, you can find a totally different approach to nanofabrication, namely bottom-up self-assembly. A single bacterium, about one micron in size, can make billions of different biomolecules in a scalable fashion and with much high, higher precision. For example, every ATPase in our body is made of exactly the same number of atoms, atomically precise manufacturing. And many of you mentioned it today. Moreover, these molecular devices, structures can exhibit behavior, complex behavior, when the potential across the membrane increases, this rotor, molecular rotor rotates at different speed. And so my dream in high school was to maybe take this bi biological components and try to build a new life form where um, we build things in a more rational way. Because if you now try to disrupt this biological system, like for example, I want to change dielectric property, refractive index of alpha crystalline, which is a component of our eye. Um, unfortunately, I can cause a cancer too because it's it's this alpha crystalline is a component of many met metabolic pathways, and so you cannot just take it out, slightly change it. It changes the whole pathway. So, I turned to engineering, and I'm an engineering professor at Berkeley, and there, um, what I like is a is a modular approach where you, have, you can take transistor, resistor, and capacitor, put, put them together in a very complex integrated circuits and build machines, devices that challenge complexity <laughs> of a human brain and in many ways out outperform it. AI, well, maybe not for, for much longer. We, we can outperform um, human brain completely. But if you look at the Natural designs, there are many really bad designs. We eat and breathe through the same passageway, major choking hazard. You probably can come up with some other examples. Anybody? Bad designs in your body and nature? Like, <coughs> so 
Or yeah, blind spot in the eye, Christine says. Yes? What? This is an old one. The sewer and the playground are right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to put it. So this laryngeal nerve that I, I used to speak to you right now, that's two feet of wasted wiring, right? Just because we evolved from fish. You know, as an engineer, you would just nip it, reconnect at the top. But since we evolved from fish, it's not possible. Nanoscale, Rubisco is the laziest possible enzyme. You know, typically enzymes convert thousands of molecules per minute, per second. Rubisco makes maybe two molecules of oxygen from CO2. Sometimes it grabs oxygen and burns glucose. Um, so I thought, could, could we maybe combine the strengths of rational top-down engineering of, let's say, electrical engineering, nanofabrication, and bottom-up self-assembly, something like this to build a new nanotechnology. And I think it's possible. <laughs> and I'm not sure what's the best technology, but what I'm using right now is DNA nanotechnology. And many of you know what DNA is. Stack of bases, very simple rules, A, T, G, C. You can consider it one and zero. And you can use those rules to build very complex molecules like DNA origami that Adam and some other people already referred to. It's really an amazing process that allows you to assemble, uh, for example, this. Uh, so you use ATGC to bring this long black scaffold together with a bunch of synthetic DNA strands. It, and they'll magically assemble into a structure like the smiley face or map of North America. So basically, it's kind of 2D positioning. No printer required. So what's revolutionary here is you suddenly doubt molecules with a programming language. By programming sequence of these molecules, you can make them fold into any shapes. And I have to say, go bears, because I'm from <laughs> Berkeley. And so single DNA origami, it's about 100 by 100 nanometers, and it's big enough to make a single transistor. But if you want to make something more complex like this photoreceptor photo circuit, we need a much larger breadboard, one minute left. So I'm going to tell you a bit my work as a postdoc. I tried to make nanoscale Mona Lisa. And you know it's no Da Vinci, but we can make trillions of this in a test tube. It's atomic force microscope. And I'm just going to quickly switch tell you what my lab is doing right now. We're trying to bring in materials with interest in physics and use DNA as an information bearing molecule. So you can see it's kind of 3D printing, but in a massively parallel way. And there is always a question, what's the first killer app? What would convince this country or <coughs> bigger scientific community to invest more money? They cannot just, we're not competing with Russia to go to the moon. We're trying to make spend taxpayers' money in, in, a, in a sensible way to cure cancer or build some devices that can make profit. So one of these devices is a bare filter. You all have it in your cameras that um, kind of allows to analyze RGB components because you only have three cones in your eye. And so we can assemble this structure in 3D by encoding DNA, uh, by endowing Two dielectrics, you only need two different materials. Let's say silicon oxide and titanium dioxide. You just need to attach DNA strands in precise position to make them self-assemble into these complex structures. And we do inverse electromagnetic designs, design software for DNA nanostructure design, and we self-assemble them. And this is an example of how this kind of 3D printer, but a scalable, 3D printer that would allow you to make billions of devices so you can satisfy demands of humanity for this particular component um, quickly. And as a so very first PhD student who joined my lab, um, he played hockey for MIT and uh, he got concussion. And since then, he got interested in um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and so he wanted to find a way to read out single neuron activity 
with millisecond resolution, but we cannot use optogenetics. Many of you know optogenetics. So typically right now it's done by drilling a hole. Um, so that's electrochemical readout, electrical readout. You drill a hole um, and you insert this neuropixel electrode that can at most read out 200 neurons at the same time. So he is now developing a way to read out many more neurons in a non-invasive way that um, uses magnetic field that of course can go very well through the skull. And um, this, let me conclude because Alice, Alison is looking at me. So I'm just gonna. <laughs> yeah, this is my lab. Thank you. Uh, yeah, do I remember him? Okay, questions, mm -hmm. comments? Maybe if we can one. Or we'll leave it to the, yeah, we're in. Okay. So interesting talk on uh, the DNA kind of matching. Uh, so you're using the complementarity of, of DNA as the main kind of organizational tool. But of course, in biology, so DNA has multiple levels of organization, uh, epigenetics essentially. So you can have, you know, small scale around a histone, or you can have macro, you know, domains and such. So has any of that been explored in kind of um, the evolved kind of uh, macro assembly properties, or is it still right now just the the small scale interaction that's still being used? Yeah, great question. We also use multiple scales. We, we do things in a hierarchical way. So ideally what you want to do is to mix thousands of components and they recognize each other. But turns out the yields are pretty low. So what we eventually ended up using is you make a system that, for example, assembles into from four building blocks into one building block. You use four of those bigger building blocks to make even bigger and so on, so-called fractal or hierarchical assembly, and our body is actually hierarchical. We go from molecules to cells to tissues to, to organs. But what is guiding the, the larger scale interactions though? If, I mean, fractal, yeah, you just repeat the pattern over and over again, but what, is there a greater kind of then interaction? Yeah, we try to, to, to keep the same rules. We use DNA sticky ends only for each step. Okay, it's still just the, the sequence of, of ATGCs. Okay. Thank you so much.